We know that God never intended faith to be complicated, but if we're honest, we're a little complicated. So to help you on your journey of faith, we developed the Uncomplicated app. You can go to the app store, download it today, and there you will find a place where you can read and listen to the Bible. There are courses that you can take on uh, faith and the big questions of faith. There's also podcast episodes you can listen to where people have asked questions about faith and we answer them. You also can download devotionals that take you daily through different books of the Bible so you can grow in faith. We know that God wants you to grow and to thrive and he has so much in store for you as you follow him. So go download the app today. Is there any better icon for what it means to be a man than when God comes to earth and is a man? Is there anybody greater to demonstrate manhood than Jesus Christ? Is he the ultimate man or is he the ultimate man? Does he show us what it looks like to be a man? What is masculinity and da, 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 just a gender contract? Listen to me, we're gonna look at Jesus. And we're gonna look at Jesus and we're gonna see what it means to be a real man. To the person next to you say, real man. Okay, so we're gonna take some like cliches, you know, that we joke about, and then we're going to redeem them, okay? So the first part will be like a little bit of a cliche, but then we'll show how Jesus actually, uh, you know, models this and how he lives this out, and we'll, we'll be inspired by Jesus, and we'll put into practice how he lives his life, how, we're, uh, how he lived his life here on earth as a man. Now, we're gonna say Luke chapter 19, if you wanna turn there. And this is, uh, my wife's like, are you gonna talk about? I'm like, yes, I'm going to talk about my favorite. Yes, because there is a story where Jesus makes a whip and goes in and drives people out of the temple courts. Have you guys heard this one? It is the wildest thing that Jesus, like, I wanna talk, can we just talk, can we just have a manly sermon today? Can we just talk about Jesus with a whip? Just, just, can we talk about that today? And if you're a lady and you're like, oh, I just kinda wanted to hear about, you know, rainbows and, and you know, cherubim and seraphim, listen to me. Maybe, maybe you don't know what to look for in a man. And so maybe this is a good one. Maybe this is a good one. This is, we're gonna look at the ultimate man and it, maybe it'll be good, right? So it'll be good. Luke chapter 19. Um, you know, it says here that, uh, oh, by the way, real quick, I always forget to do this. I wrote a book on manhood called The Man Code, okay? Um, and it, it's, it's 10 tenets of manhood. So we can get that afterward if you want to, you and your son want to read it together. My son and I are going through a whole year of rite of passage thing. And so I really wrote him that in mind. It's 10 tenets of manhood. And uh, if, if your husband did get you like a really lousy, day, lousy like Mother's Day gift, like maybe he got you like a treadmill or something like that, just get him this book and be like, I just thought maybe, I thought maybe you wanted to look at what it means to be a man. Okay, Justice, don't. All right, here we go. <laughs> here we go. Luke chapter, Luke chapter 19. Okay, you got three points on being a man, and we're going to look at Jesus here. Now, I, I got to summarize this because it's a really important moment of Jesus' life. The context is super important. And it says here that Jesus rides into the city on a donkey, and this is the last couple days of his life. Okay, why is Jesus riding into the capital, Jerusalem, where the temple is? Why is he riding in on a donkey? Well, number one, that is fulfilling the scripture, uh, an Old Testament prophecy, so that you know he's the Messiah. But also, because people were really hyped on Jesus. Okay, they really were starting to believe, because of the miracles and his teaching, and he was a man of the people, they really believed that he could be the Messiah, and they wanted him to like overthrow the Romans. And so one of the reasons why Jesus rode on a donkey is because if he would have come in on a, on a horse or like on a steed, people would have went nuts. It would have felt like he came in to lead a revolution. Are you guys with me on this? So he comes in all humble, humble like on a donkey, right? Which is kind of like just like a silly thing, almost looking thing. But the truth is, is people, were, they didn't care. They're waving palm branches. They're saying like, they're, they're making all these statements about him saying Hosanna. The, the palm branch was the national symbol of Israel. So like there is this really like emotionally charged spiritually charged, politically charged moment happening here. And Jesus is like coming into the main area and, 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 and he gets there and it says that the, 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 the people are yelling his name and stuff. And, and one of the, the, the leaders go, hey, um, you need to tell them to stop calling you king. And you can't do that. Like that's, that, there's only one, you can't do that. And then Jesus goes, if I tell them to stop worshiping me, 
then the rocks will cry out and worship me. Like it's, I want you to understand, like this is like, like a crazy like moment. What's Jesus thinking? He's thinking about them. He's thinking about how, does he know that he's gonna die on the cross? Does he know that, yes or no? Yeah, so he's got that on his mind. He's thinking about maximizing this time. And it says that as he approaches, it says he starts crying. He starts crying and he's looking at the people and he's looking at the temple and he's specifically the temple and he starts crying. And so I'm gonna, we're gonna read like five verses here, but it starts with Jesus crying, right? And I just thought that's interesting because, it, because a lot of men, they're like, oh, you know, men don't cry and stuff like that. And um, I mean, I get it. I mean, I don't cry, but the, 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 <laughs> we have two different account, accounts where Jesus cries and Jesus goes from crying over the people and over the temple and over what's gonna happen to then being moved with compassion, taking all that, 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 that sadness, that grief, that energy that a lot of guys just like push down, right? And he says, you know what? I'm gonna make, I'm, this is gonna lead me to action. And he does something with that passion. He does something with that zeal. And he, um, he makes a whip of ropes, not one rope, multiple ropes. Can I read it to you? It's in John chapter two. John chapter two, it says this. Now this happens on all four of the gospel accounts, so I'm just kind of bouncing around, but I like John two, what it says here. It says, uh, um, when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, I mean, everybody's there, pro probably 50,000 people at the temple courts, gigantic moment. Everybody's there from all around the nation and beyond. This is the big day. Jesus went up to Jerusalem and the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords. Didn't buy a whip, didn't borrow a whip, made a whip. How upset do you have to be to make your own weapon? <laughs> to fabricate it, right? Like, I don't even know. I, I was like, hey, I just picture him like crying and then being upset and then being like, you know what? I'm just gonna, I'm gonna take a moment. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna get, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna get centered, okay? And I'm going to build a weapon. Uh, James, John, Peter, bring me some ropes. Bring me the skinniest little ropes you can. I want them skinny. I want them skinny, no wind resistance. I want a cat of nine tails with this sucker. He makes the whip, he's like clearing, he's like, clearing tears from his eyes as he's just like braiding this, <laughs> this whip together. It's so gnarly. Uh, and others are sitting and exchanging money. So he made a whip of cords and drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. And he scattered the coins of the money changers and he overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews responded to him, what sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this and Jesus answered destroy this temple I'll raise it up in three days what's he talking about he's like dude there's only one person who's allowed to do this in the temple my disciples you don't see the disciples like oh we're making whips rabbi is this uh, how to make whips 101 teach us how to make whips right and they all made whips and they all went in there just like a clan of Indiana Jones just is that what they did no Jesus goes kick back there's only one person who can do this it's me, because it's my father's house. Are you guys with me on this? Jesus goes in, and does he whip anybody, yes or no? Does anybody get whipped? This is not a trick question. Does anybody get whipped? No. Jesus wouldn't whip anybody. You know, when you make a good whip, can we just have whip class, whip, whip class real quick? When you make a good whip, you know what? I don't think you guys get it. Who in here had a good dad who disciplined them? <laughs> who had a good dad who lit them up because you deserved it? <laughs> who had that dad? Did your dad have a whip? My dad had a whip, he had a whole closet full of them. I had to go in there and pick which one I wanted to be whipped with. They were called belts. Are you guys remember? Who got the belt? Justice, are you endorsing spanking your kids? Listen, I'm talking about my life, okay? This is my truth, this is my experience, okay? I had a good dad, I had a good dad. He was from Texas, okay? He never gave me a spanking in my life because I got whoopings. Anybody get whooped, bro? Whooped, whooped. He didn't braid them together, it was just one, but he would go in and just, you know, you know what he would do though? Because uh, maybe he whipped me. I don't really remember if he whipped me because I, you know, I blocked that out. But <laughs> I definitely remember the sound when he was going. You guys know what I'm talking about. What'd you do with the belt when it was time? When you knew it was coming? Carlton knows, right, right? It's like, dude, it just, you just fold it over, right? It's like, stop, stop, stop. 
that, right? And it's like, dude, I'm doing the dishes, I'm taking out the trash, I'm petting the dog, like whatever I have to do that I didn't do because I heard that, that, right? And that's exactly what Jesus is doing. He's not using violence, listen to me, Jesus is anti-violence, you guys know that, right? He's anti-violence. This is Mr. Turn the Other Cheek. This is Mr. Pray for Your Enemies, right? But he uses force. There's a difference between violence and force. For, violence is when you get whipped. Force is when you just crack the whip and you let them know you better step aside. Jesus goes in and starts cracking that whip and he's kicking over money tables, right? And there's animals running all over the place and there's birds flying all over the place and there's money going up in the air and he's just single-handedly clearing out thousands of people from the temple courts and you're like what on earth would light him up like this why would Jesus be this upset so let's get into it for a second because this is a very manly thing for Jesus to do clearly just a one-man wrecking crew on the whole thing but also he is moved from compassion remember he's crying a moment before this so what is it that's really breaking his heart so that's the thing something has broken his heart and he has turned this into a righteous anger right and he does something very powerful here okay and I'm going to show you a picture of the temple courts okay this is a diagram that uh, I made myself on Microsoft Paint. No, I'm just kidding. Do you guys remember Microsoft Paint? Anyways, with the pixels. Anybody remember, anybody remember Mario Paint on Super Nintendo? No? Okay, all right, awesome. Um, I found this online, but this is great. This is, uh, it's not a real picture. It's a drawing of the temple courts. And you can see the different areas. You guys see the outside one? And then the, see that, what's that say at the very farthest area? quarter Gentiles. Okay, you can take the picture off. I just want you to see that. So there's these basically like these centric, 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 there's these circles. <laughs> centric, what is the word I'm looking for? Whatever, dude. Okay. Uh, there's these layers, right, that come in. And what's in the middle? The Holy of Holies, right? This is the holiest place in the world, right? This is the presence of God. This is the temple, right? But then there's these courts, Men, women, priests, Gentiles, right? And the outer one is called the court of Gentiles or the court of the nations. And see, the, the, the way this worked was there's only one person who could make it in the very center. That was the holiest person. But everybody else, according to like your worthiness, right? Or your cleanness or your, you were able to make it in, right? And that was kind of how you made your way in. Not everybody could go, could go in. There was like the priests. And then the outerest outer concentric square is the court of Gentiles or the court of nations. This is where people who were not Jewish, they could go on the holiest day of the year and they could worship and they could witness God and they could participate. It was the biggest area because it was the area for visitors and people from all around the world would come to, to, to worship the God of the Bible on this day and that they had a huge area for them. But what happened in Jesus' day, because things had gotten so corrupt over the years and over the years and over the generations, that now the court of Gentiles, the biggest space, had now become the marketplace. And now everything was being set up there, all the money changing and all of the buying and selling of animals. And so there's two things that were happening there that really lit Jesus up. One of them is certain money was used to give to God and to give to the temple, right? And you, could, you had to exchange your own money for special temple money before you could give it. And when you did that, you lost the value of your money uh, big time. And so there was a huge corruption that had happened where people who were poor were being ripped off because they weren't able to give their full offering because their money wasn't good enough and they were being, it was, had to be exchanged at this incredible rate. Nod your head if you guys are with me. So the people who were, least what the people who are really impoverished who travel a long way who are just there to worship you know they didn't have enough money and they're they're being ripped off in order for their what they did have to even count okay so jesus is seeing this he's known this has been this going on this way for years and another thing that was going on was not only did they exchange money but they exchanged animals for, for sacrifice because the scripture says that the there's a certain type of you know goat that has to be sacrificed and, and what would happen is you'd have a family from a really long way away and they'd be walking for days and they would have a little goat with them and they would be taking the goat with them to you know, sacrifice, but that goat would brush up against a thorn bush and that would prick, the, prick the, the leg of the goat and now it's got some blood on it or a blemish or maybe it's, you know, and they would get there and they'd be like, here, here I'm gonna give this to the priest so it could be sacrificed, but they go, no, you can't because that, that's not good enough. But you know what? 
even though your sacrifice isn't good enough, this is your lucky day, because I have one right here that you can buy. Yeah, it's 50 times more expensive than that one, but hey, what are you gonna do? Walk all the way back home? Do you guys see how people are getting ripped off? And so you got the money exchanging, you got this animal exchanging thing happen, and then one of them was doves, and doves was the lowest animal that you could actually sacrifice. It was, it was a provision in the Old Testament for those that were poor. In fact, when you read about Jesus being dedicated in the temple, Mary gave doves or pigeons. This was a, this was a, the, the cheapest, this is the, the cheapest one they had. So, you, so even the, mo, the, 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 the poorest people, all they had was this bird. Even that wasn't counted. Their feathers weren't good enough or something. And I was reading about how like, we're talking, normally a bird would cost two shekels, but the ones that they sold at the temple, we have on record, just, you know, uh, Josephus wrote about this, 75 shekels. So what is that? That's like an insane absorbent. That's just, uh, that's like, that kind of ripoff, like it was, it was, it was, it was breaking Jesus's heart. He's like, you're ripping off poor people. You're telling people that they're not good enough. You're making it harder for them to come and worship God. And you're crowding out the area that was for, this is the worst one, the Gentiles. You've literally crowded out the space where people who don't even worship our God can even get in. The people who are the least worthy are being kicked out. They're, they can't even get in. They can't see because you've turned my father's house into a marketplace. And he's thinking about this as he's just making a whip. You know, he's just building this whip. He's just like, man, these religious leaders making it harder on people, making them feel less than, make it, taking advantage of poor people. And he's like, man, I gotta do something about this. And so that's why he makes this whip. And that's why he goes in there single-handedly and just, just clears them all out, right? Now, there's, there's, there's three things that I see that is in Jesus's character here and in his behavior that I think all men can look up to. And the first one, you know, we're gonna start with these cliches and we're gonna redeem it. The first one is real men aren't afraid. Turn to the person next to you and say, real men aren't afraid. <laughs> real men aren't afraid. My kids are like, dad, what are you afraid of? I'm like, your dad's not afraid of your mom. Um, <laughs> real men aren't afraid. Listen, two, say it with me, sacrifice. sacrifice. What's a sacrifice? A sacrifice is something that costs you something. In fact, nothing in life is valuable that doesn't come at a sacrifice, yes or yes. The more valuable it is, the more sacrifice it took to get it. The most valuable things in our life are the greatest sacrifice. That's why money has any weight at all, because you had to sacrifice to get the money. That's why it has value, right? So uh, Jesus shows us that he's willing to be a sacrifice. He says in, in, in Mark chapter... Um, 10 verse 45, uh, excuse me, um, not Mark, in John 10. No one can take my life from me, Jesus says. I sacrifice it voluntarily. Jesus says, my life is a sacrifice. I lay down my life. Nobody can take my life. I give my life. I am a sacrifice. As it says in Romans 12, 1, that true worship is to be a daily sacrifice for God. Now, when I say the word sacrifice, I don't know what goes through your mind, but I think of the military. I think of first responders. I think of all the people that I admire that live every single day running in when people are running out. Are you with me? And we admire people who make a sacrifice, right? We admire the military because of their sacrifice. That's why we love veterans. We admire, you know, I remember being on career day as a kid and one of my friends, his dad was a police officer and his dad brought a cop car to the elementary school and turned the siren on. And I'm like, this kid is now the coolest kid in school because your dad is a police officer. He carries a gun, he has a siren, you get to ride in the cop car, like this is amazing. And the, but why was he the hero? Because he served and protected, right? He, he, he made a sacrifice. He was willing to lay it down for the community, right? We see, you know, that this, wherever sacrifice is connected, we see courage and bravery, right? Now, if someone takes your life from you, that's not a sacrifice, but if you lay it down, it is a sacrifice. And that's why we say that nobody murdered Jesus because Jesus lays his life down. He, nobody killed Jesus. Jesus, Jesus gave his life. He says he could pick it back up again too. He willingly laid his life down. And men, when you willingly lay your life down, you are living sacrificially and you are looking like Jesus. 
And inside every single man, and woman too, please don't make me just bring a bunch of caveats to this, okay? Listen, inside every person who's made in the image of God, there is something in your DNA, but I know as a man, there is something about living as a sacrifice that I want. I want my life to matter. Any other guys in the house? I want my life to matter. There's something about being a sacrifice for my wife and for my kids that just gets me excited. It's like, man, that's purpose to my life. And I just wanna, I just wanna admonish, I just wanna encourage every man here who sacrifices every single day, you go to work, you go to a job maybe that you hate or maybe that you love. You go to a job where you're affirmed or maybe where you're, where, you're, where, you're, where you're not. You go to a job nonetheless, you make money, you come home, you spend it on your family, you pay for the house, you make sure your kids have what they need. You are a living sacrifice. You take that hard work and you actually give it to your family. Way to go. That looks like Jesus more than you realize. Can we give it up for the dads who have jobs, who work? That's not to take away from the moms. Moms, equally important. But dad, I just want you to know, you going to work is a very biblical and sacrificial thing that looks like Jesus more than you realize. So maybe today you make a switch where you go, yeah, you know what, I'm gonna go to work tomorrow and even though I hate my job, I love my family. Even though I can't stand my boss, I love my savior, I'm gonna do it to him. There's a great verse in Colossians that says, hey, when you work for another man, do it like you're doing it for God and work heartily. Because you're not really serving him, you're serving God. Did you know that when you go to work and you have a good attitude and you're on time and you make a sacrifice, you can just turn around and dedicate that to God. And you know what, maybe, maybe you don't like your job, maybe you don't like your setup, but you're grateful for it, can I get an amen? Because it makes you be able to love and serve your family. And your kids grow up and they see dad with a job and they see dad working hard and they see dad making a sacrifice. And you look more like Jesus to them than you realize. It's very biblical for men to work, right? Adam, the very first man who was ever created, before God entrusted him with a woman, he had to prove himself with a job. You guys know that? He had to go name all those animals, right? And based on that, God goes, okay, now I can entrust you with something better, right? I'll give you a help. But first, we had to mature you. You had to take responsibility for something other than yourself. And even though it's just animals and even it's just, it was, it was stepping stone for him. And men, the more you make sacrifice, the more you show that God can trust you with more. I was talking to my son yesterday and uh, he was asking me about being a man and being a, being a, and I just said, the number one thing, the number one most important thing of being a, a man, son, is just being able to sacrifice, right? The more you're able to sacrifice, the more you lay down your life, that's really the journey of being a man, right? It even says in Ephesians 5, the way we love our wives is at the standard of sacrifice, right? It says you love your wife the way Christ loved the church, giving himself up for the church, right? He laid his life down for the church. He died for you and me. That's why we had this sacrificial you know, example for how to love and serve our wives. And so being a sacrifice, whether it's at work or whether it's doing things you don't wanna do or whether it's things you're already doing that you didn't realize, these are things that look, when you live sacrificially, remember you're looking like Jesus, right? Real men make a sacrifice. Can I get an amen from the dudes in the house? Can I get an amen? You dudes did, had an opportunity right now. Can I get an amen from the brothers in the church? Can I get an amen? amen? You know what, next time maybe just beat your chest or something? Like, this is our day, guys, this is our day. Okay, all right. <laughs> Real men aren't afraid to sacrifice. Real men train. Come on to the person next to you say, Real men train. Real, say it like you, you're about to just lift some weights. Real men train. Come on, real men train. Real men train. This is a cliche, right? But what do we train? I love this scripture, it says in 1 Timothy 4, physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better. Hey, did you know you have to train your faith? Real men train their faith. Did you have to train, you have to train your faith. You're given a measure of faith, but if you want your faith to grow, you have to train it. Just like if you wanna train your muscles, you have to train them. If you wanna train your faith, you have to train it, right? Scripture says in Hebrews, faith is a substance of things that are unseen but hoped for. Like, it's a substance. There is, there's a capacity for faith. And just like if you, wanna, if, you, if you wanna lift more weight, you gotta put more weight on the bar, just incrementally. It's the same way, if you, wanna tr if you wanna be stronger in your faith, you have to train it. You have to put weight on the bar. And 
we don't, a lot of times we think that being a person of faith is about making big decisions or taking giant leaps. But the truth is, is that actually training your faith happens in the gym of life. It happens every day. It doesn't happen in these huge giant opportunities. The huge giant opportunities come if you've been trained and you're ready for it. Can I get a witness? I love to watch this uh, show on, on uh, there's, uh, I think there's seven seasons of this show and I wanna say I've seen all of them. It's like extreme makeover, but like health edition where they take somebody who's like really just uh, I've been morbidly obese and they've just, just an awful, like they're on the verge of death and they, t- they journey with them for a year and then they have this big reveal where they, you know, their, their life has been totally changed. It's a one year, like each episode is one year. Have you guys seen this show? I don't know the name of it. It's like Extreme Home, I don't know. But you know what? I sing the same worship songs every Sunday. I don't know those words either. Any dudes have this problem? Any dudes have this problem? There's things we just don't need to know. We don't need to know these little things. We're thinking about other things, okay. And if like I'm watching TV and you're talking to me, sweetheart, I can't think about what you're saying and the TV at the same time. Any other dudes have this problem? I just, I feel like my brain can only do one thing at one time. Anyways, back to what I'm supposed to do right now. Um, <laughs> the thing about that show is I, it's a one year of someone's life. And when you watch the beginning, you see them struggling and they're, you know, they're, they're, they're so unhealthy and they're, and they're dying. And they get, this person comes in and rescues them and this trainer and they put them on this program and they're gonna get healthy. And then you see the end of the show and everyone's crying because their life has changed. And what I like to do, play the music even softer. What I like to do, I like to watch the first five minutes and then skip to the end. Do you guys like to do that too? Where you just see the track? Because the middle part, the middle part is actually not really what I wanna see. Because they're interviewing people and they're talking about these different things and you know, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. What I wanna see, forgive me, I'm a dude, what I wanna see is what are they doing in the gym to get those kind of results? What are they doing? What exercises are they doing? What are they eating? Where do they buy their Ozempic? Where do they get this stuff? How do they get these kind of results in such a short amount, in one year? Show me the workout plan. Show me what you're doing, right? And I've watched like a million of these episodes and they never show, they don't really show them in the gym. It's very, they don't really show that. They show their backstory. They show their, their trauma that's getting healed. They show their friends and family, but they don't really show the workouts. And I was thinking to myself, why don't they show the workouts? That's the secret. The secret is what they're doing in the gym. And then I realized, because it would be a very boring show, because actually, just those small little incremental gains, they're just going to the gym, doing the same thing over and over again, just doing it again the next day, just only eating chicken breast and not eating, you know, cake pops from Starbucks or whatever, just the same little thing every day. Like, that's a, that is not a fun show to watch. It's boring, it's boring. And I'm just gonna tell you something. I don't know if anyone's ever told you this, but men, if you wanna train your faith to be a mighty man of God who can handle the great purpose that God has for your life, I'm gonna tell you, training for you is gonna be pretty boring. Because training in godliness is obedience. And obedience is not a fun thing to watch. Men, obedience is mostly about what we don't do. Obedience is, I'm doing the dishes, my wife is saying something to me, I just thought of a zinger who's with me, and I don't say it. It's happened once. And I don't say it because I use self-control. That's a small step of obedience in how to honor my wife. Are you guys with me? It's I'm with my friends. They're making a joke and it's off colored and it's, you know, Ephesians 4 says, let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, right? And they're saying this thing about this and I don't laugh at the jokes. It's my friends at work who they're gossiping about somebody because they're out to, and I don't join in on that. It's the girl walking across the, the, the crosswalk who, you know, probably could be wearing more clothes. God bless her. Maybe she doesn't, maybe she lost some of them. And you, and you look down and you don't look at the, it's the small, it's the movies that you don't watch because you know it's not good for your heart. It's the things that you don't do that often build, right? 
It's the keeping your word, coming home on time when you say you're gonna be there. That's a boring episode to watch. But don't you know in the spiritual realm, you're putting in reps. You're making gains. You're adding more weight to the bar. And then when the real test comes, come on, you're ready, man, because you've been taking little steps. Obedience is how you train your faith. That's how you get strong enough for the great assignment that God has for you. And I, I see a lot of men destroy their lives, guys. A lot of men. I'm a pastor. When someone's life is falling apart, I'm the phone call. I'm at the house during the, when they've had the affair. I'm there when they get caught cheating. I'm there when they go bankrupt. I'm there when you find out about the money that they were putting on a credit card. I'm there, I, I, I'm there when that stuff happens, right? And what I've found is it's not usually an explosion. It's actually an implosion. Because when you're a boy, you don't have responsibilities. You're only responsible for yourself. That's why you're called a boy. When you're a man, you're taking responsibility for other people other than yourself. That's why you're a man. There's a lot of people who go, I'm good. I just want to be a boy. I don't care how biologically old I am. I want to be a professional video game player and live with my mom and take four units of community college and drive an expensive car. I'm sorry if I'm picking on you. But when you're ready to go up, grow up, look to Jesus because he will teach you how to take responsibility for other people how to pray for those that persecute you, how to lay down your life, how to give to those who ask, how to take a, a woman, how to raise kids, how to lead a family. As you, you're a boy, you're only responsible for yourself. You're a boy. I don't care if you shave, you're a boy. If you only take care of yourself. If you live with your mom, you're not paying her rent, you'd rather have a nice car than help with groceries in your house. You, this is boy stuff, guys. Yeah, but man, my call of duty? You should see my score on Modern Warfare. Listen, you're just, your boy. And if you want to be trusted with a woman, if you want to be trusted with a family, if you want to have a career, if you want to be a mentor to others, if you want to have a life of influence, you got to grow up. That's why I wrote the book, The Man Code. How to go from being a boy to being a man, 10 things. And when you take responsibility for somebody else, right? It gets heavy, it gets heavy. That's why manhood is associated with strength because the more responsibility you take, the more strength you need, right? And I get these phone calls of people's lives that are falling apart and it's not because they did one thing or it was because it was this huge explosion and they just out of nowhere no, it's because the weight of their life, the responsibility on their shoulders of being a man, of looking after her and the kids and the job and the finances and the mortgage and all that kind of stuff and the, the way people are looking to you and the expectations of being a man, the weight was so heavy that the character that was holding it up wasn't strong enough and it impossible exploded and the character wasn't strong enough to hold up the weight of the responsibility of being a man and that's why you have to train in godliness so that you are ready and strong and you can handle the great things God has for you there's not a man in this room who God doesn't have legacy and destiny and you are made to make a difference with your life you've been called to live out a huge influential calling of raising families and generations and the Jesus way is the biggest way. Jesus said, I came to give life, life to the fullest. There's gigantic life. There's a life so big for you, man, you're gonna stand before your father and he's gonna say, well done, son. You are a good and faithful servant. That's, the, that's what you're headed toward. But if you don't learn small steps of obedience that train your character, when it comes time for you to 
bite off more of that responsibility, you will sink, you'll crumble under the weight of these things. So you have to get ready. You gotta train. And the training is boring. But the training is saying yes to Jesus. It's obeying him when he speaks to. It's not doing the things that you know or immature and boyhood. It's just rep after rep. It's brick after brick. It's just incremental reps. Will you stand to your feet? I'm gonna end a little bit early today because it's Father's Day and I feel like all the dads could end a little bit early. Is that a good Father's Day gift? What is it, five minutes early? I feel like we just ended a little early. No dads ever cry about ending early. The last point is real men take a stand. Oh yeah, real men take a stand. Real men take a stand for people who can't. And that's what Jesus is doing here with the whip. He's taking a stand for people who can't. You know, this is where the guests were supposed to be. This is where the people who weren't worthy were supposed to be. And Jesus comes in there and he whips everything out of the way that was between them and God. He clears the temple so that there's more room for them and God. And that's who he was then. That's who he is now. That's who he'll forever be. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is so strong that he removes every barrier between you and the Father, starting with our sin, then he gives you the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. And then if you're here and uh, you, you, uh, you're feeling like you wanna live a life bigger than yourself and you want between this Father's Day and next Father's Day to really make some gains, so that maybe those people in your life that don't have someone to stand for them, you could, you could actually do something with that strength that he gave you. Just raise your hand if you're a dad here and you just need some prayer today. So if you're a dad, just raise your hand. All the dads, in fact, you know what? Forget what I said, if you're a dad, just raise your hand. We're just gonna pray for you, whether you like it or not. If you're a dad, just raise your hand. Would you do this? Just put a hand on the shoulder of one of these dads. Just put a hand, right? Put a hand on one of their shoulders, yeah? Yeah, Father's Day is the lowest attended day on the church calendar, but not here, because there's some great men in this church. And I just wanna say thank you as your pastor for being great fathers, going to work every day, whether you want to or not, taking care of your family, honoring your wife, loving your kids. I wanna say thank you for serving on our volunteer teams. I wanna say thank you for serving in the parking lot when people drive in and maybe they don't have the best attitude because they haven't had their donut yet and you just love them. I wanna say thank you for serving in the kids ministry. Maybe there's kids there, I know that there are, who don't have dads. We had a kid come in the other day without shoes and there's dads in there loving and serving families, single parents, holding babies, mentoring kids. I wanna say thank you to the dads who are a part of Kids Hope down the street who are mentoring once a week at-risk kids at our local elementary school. I wanna say thank you to the dads who just putting their biceps to work, loading up cars through the drive through pantry, 400 cars a week coming through. You're just loading groceries into the back of those cars for families that don't have food, but you took off time of what you could have been doing for yourself to make a sacrifice to serve those families driving through. I just wanna say thank you to all the dads who who serve, who have self-control, who honor God with your decisions, your behavior, your conduct, who even if you're not seen enough and recognized and affirmed enough, you have a heavenly father who sees you and I wanna pray a blessing for you. Lord, I pray that you bless every dad. I pray that you bless them with a closeness with you this year. I pray that you put on their mind a next step toward really living a life that is bigger than themselves. Lord, I pray that you'd help combat the lies with the Holy Spirit that would tell them that nobody sees or that nobody cares or they're not doing a good enough job. Lord, we thank you that we are not failures, but we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. Lord, I pray that you'd bless their life, their marriages, their families, their health. And I pray you'd do something in them that the rest of the world would look at it and they would say, that's what, that's what manhood's supposed to look like. That's what the father I should have had. That's, the, that's, what, that's what masculinity looks like in being a man. Lord, thank you for the incredible opportunity to be like you, Jesus, on this earth and to represent such an important thing to the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen? Hey, if today you made it, a, if you wanna make a decision,
to give your life to Jesus. If you've never put your faith in Jesus and you, today you wanna start following him, we have a free Bible for you. There's a, there's a fresh start box over there. There's a Bible. There's some resources we wanna give them to you. So if you wanna like start following Jesus today, let's pray for you. Let's begin that journey with you today. God bless you guys. Happy Father's Day. We'll see you next week.